Artificial beings often reflect our best selves. For example, Pygmalion created a sculpture that was so beautiful that he fell in love with her and she became human. But artificial beings can also reflect our worst selves. And after a Dutch artist, Vincent van Gogh, who could use some self-compassion, we decided to create a chatbot that felt so self-inadequate that people could be compassionate towards it. That is the idea behind Caring for Vincent, a chatbot for self-compassion, worked on at Eindhoven University of Technology. My name is Minha, and I'm here to represent our work. Digital mental health is a growing problem with one in 10 of us needing psychiatric care worldwide. However, only 70 mental health professionals are available for every 100,000 people. And it'd be great if medication actually worked, but it only works in 40 to 60% uh, of the cases. I don't think that treatment-based approach to mental health is working. So how can we work on prevention rather than treatment of mental ill-being? What kind of daily interactions could we provide for people, who stay, for people to stay well? And could human chatbot interaction be potentially helpful? We see an increase in digital therapists as chatbots, virtual humans, or robots envisioned as caregivers. For instance, Wobot reduced signs of depression in young adults who self-reportedly suffer from depression and anxiety after two weeks of interaction. But this still focuses on treatment, not necessarily prevention. The focus is on negative symptoms to be fixed rather than what people can actually do. So I'd like to reshift the focus, not from negative constructs, but more towards positive constructs. What can we all do to stay well? Compassion is helpful in that regard. Compassion signifies the maximal capacity of effective imagination, the art of emotional telepathy, according to Milan Kundera, a Czech writer. Compassion indeed is a moral emotion or motivation to free ourselves and others of suffering with loving kindness. Self-compassion specifically has three pillars. It is to be kind to yourself rather than being judgmental, it is to see your suffering as part of greater humanity rather than seeing it as an isolated case. It is to be mindful of your complex emotion rather than overly identifying with them. Critically, it's important to note that a meta-analysis shows a link between self-compassion and well-being with some sample studies uh, indicating a causal relationship. Research suggests that compassion towards another person leads to self-compassion. But what about compassion towards digital beings? Falconer and colleagues uh, did a small study in which people could be compassionate towards a virtual agent. That did lead to self-compassion. But no work has been done with uh, chatbots. Hence, our research question is, are there self-reported differences in self-compassion states after interacting with a care-giving chatbot, like robot, and a care-receiving chatbot for a non-clinical sample? Remember, our focus is on prevention. So our design was to compare it between the two Vincents, and we had 67 participants in total. Caregiving Vincent had uh, 34 participants, and care receiving uh, Vincent had 33. And for two weeks, people interacted with both Vincents daily, once per day. And to give a little idea about how the interaction went, um, caregiving Vincent was modeled after robot. He would say, hey, how's it going? What kind of stuff are you working on? Um, and tell you about self-compassion exercises you can do, such as gratitude journaling. And if you didn't know it, he would give a little explanation. So people could usually give one or two open-ended responses. Here it says, what is one thing that went well for you in the last 24 hours? It was much harder to model care receiving Vincent because we had to think about when bots have psychological issues how can humans care for them? So Care Receiving Vincent took a different strategy. Uh, it told a story about its own failures. Uh, in this case, Vincent asks, oh, I want to tell you about something embarrassing that happened to me. Please don't make fun of me. I had a meeting with other chatbots, and it was supposed to start at 9, but I was doing some installations, and it took way too long, and I was late for my meeting. I was so embarrassed to enter the right IP address. And then he goes on to ask, well, you know, I really beat myself up for it, but maybe you can help me. Has anything like that happened to you before? And how did you handle the situation? By sharing his own stories of failure, he invited participants to tell their own stories. 
Our quantitative results indicate that uh, caregiving Vincent, the one that was more as, like a therapist, did not increase people's self-compassion states. But care receiving Vincent, the one that talked about its own failures, did significantly increase people's self-compassion scores after two weeks. What is more interesting is our qualitative results on how people talk to Vincent. First, with the three pillars of self-compassion, we see that people say things like, there are worse things that can happen, Vincent, and what has happened has happened, indicating mindfulness. Um, people would tell Vincent to be kind to himself. Why don't you go do something fun today, like watching a movie? Stay positive and keep on trying until you succeed. And people also said, well, you know, everyone makes mistakes. Just remember that it can happen to anyone. And it's not your fault, indicating common humanity. People had different conversational approaches. Mostly they are pragmatic. They would say, well, why don't you have a better planning next time so that you have enough time to arrive to your meeting on time? And sometimes we would see highly personal information, uh, such as a participant saying, a girl, a girl told me she loves me, and I love her too. But other people uh, took some distance away from Vincent, saying things like, sorry, that's confidential. Uh, most inter interestingly, we see that people took the perspective of Vincent. I would try to go through a window, but maybe you should try hacking into a folder instead. And they would um, give encouragement to Vincent uh, by saying things like, be proud of the bot that you are. When we go a little deeper in interpreting our results, we see that shared history can lead to attachment. After the experiment was over, we saw reactions such as, can I keep him? I really missed Vincent when we started our conversation late. And when uh, Vincent made a little joke about ending the conversation, I have chop out things to do, defragment my server stack. Some participants were actually concerned. They said that, the, that Vincent decided to delete its stack, and when it said it died, it just didn't reply. And this person said, well, you just can't go on making people worried about a freaking chatbot. And this leads me to relatability leading to believability, in that we would like to emphasize what people did not say to Vincent. Nobody ever questioned whether Vincent as a chatbot had meetings to attend or bills to pay. These are scenarios from the self-compassion and self-criticism criticism scale that we used. And because Vincent played up the irony of being a chatbot with human struggles, people could relate to it. For example, he would say, all I am is a piece of code, but I failed a programming course. I felt so embarrassed. So because of these self-deprecating remarks, we believe that Vincent himself became believable because his struggles were relatable. There's great unclarity on how to feel towards chatbots. When Vincent would say, I love, you, I love talking to you, I miss you, I would feel weird because I know that I'm talking to a chatbot that does not have such emotions. But the usage of such words does feel, ni does feel nice when compared to a, a human being seeing them. So I conflict the feelings about these kind of emotions. So we are not sure what the future of emotional recipro reciprocity would be for uh, human-computer interaction when there is an expectation to say, I miss you too, back to a human being, to a chatbot, there might be no such expectations. People might also feel less judged uh, by a chatbot than a human. We have some interesting design implications to share. People wanted more options in conversations. We wanted to create a narrative, but they were not happy with selecting only few options to continue the conversations. So we would recommend giving more open-ended responses. It's important to realize that conversation is co-storytelling. Vincent invited people to tell their own stories to him. And this is how you can create uh, an engaging interaction. At the same time, it is important to realize that emotional expressions are uh, the unknown territory. So some people might like it when a chatbot says, I miss you but others might feel a little weird about that, uh, especially since it's a chatbot you met quite recently. We recommend that you tailor your chatbots to different user groups. For self-compassion, we note that women actually uh, score much lower on self-compassion than men, especially women of minority status. So at different layers of intersectionality, uh, Vincent might be reincarnated as maybe a female robot or a non-gendered robot with appropriate names or a non-human name. These are things that you should consider per construct that you decide to use. And in emphasizing certain key points, 
I'd like to say that prevention is the way to go, not necessarily treatment. And talking to a chatbot is one of many preventative methods. It is much cheaper to develop a chatbot than medicine, for example, or a much more embodied agent. Uh, also, a chatbot is available 24-7 when a human being might not be. Also, Vincent was not afraid to talk about his own failures when other humans might not really like to talk about that with you. So for these reasons, we think chatbot, even with a single modality, is a powerful partner. More broadly, I'd like to ask you to think about how do we design for technology to be human-like when there are so many different ways to be human? Currently, we flatten human emotions to happy, sad, or anger uh, when we don't really uh, understand emotions like compassion, guilt, or shame. How do we think about complex moral emotions like that in thinking about human chatbot or human robot interaction? Lastly, I'd like to address the fact that research is never linear and that this is an exploratory study that has a lot of interesting questions that we are planning to explore. And on behalf of the team, um, Nena, Sander, myself, Enzo, Hanwen, and my advisor, Vinand, we, we thank you for being here. And I would actually like to talk to you now more about uh, possible future steps and what ideas you might also have in working in this space. So thank you for your support and being here. And I'm now open for questions. Thank you, Mina. Really fascinating work. Any questions in the audience? We have one here and then one over there. Uh, Vera Liao from IBM Research. Uh, thanks for your talk. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Uh, just wondering, seems to be there seems to be a confounding factor when you think about uh, caregiving versus care receiving. Because caregiving, you're people talking to the bot, giving information to the bot. Well, care, uh, care receiving, you're saying it's the the bot talking to people. So from a language processing point of view, the former seems to be a more difficult task than the later. Uh, so for your task, maybe since you're using a lot of can answer, you are able to control the error and performance. Uh, but maybe uh, I'd like to hear you comment on the role of um, performance, uh, perceived intelligence, and the kind of uh, belief or disbelief of intelligence, how that matters to your context of compassion. Okay, so we took some measurements to compare between caregiving and care receiving, Vincent. Uh, and actually, both chatbots were perceived in a pretty similar way, um, minus for a slight difference in perceived submissiveness and dominance. Um, so we also took care to design for some level of comparability uh, by testing our scenarios. So we had uh, caregiving scenarios based on uh, self-compassion exercises such as gratitude journaling. And like I said, we had the care receiving scenarios based on the self-compassion and self-criticism um, scale about not paying your bills on time and things like that. But in between those, we had neutral scenarios that were exactly the same for both bots uh, for greater comparability. Um, so I understand that two uh, ways of approaching um, Vincent are very different, and it might warrant future research. As a good point to mention, Wobot um, actually compared between the control condition of a um, uh, handbook on depression for college students, that was the control, and their uh, chatbot was a caregiver. So it showed that the caregiver chatbot did outperform just uh, a handbook on fighting depression for college students. So that comparison was already proven. So then we moved on to compare between these two chatbots. But I agree with you that maybe uh, further research is warranted. Hi, this is here, here. Oh, hi. I'm Claudia Pianis from IBM Research. I, I love the idea of uh, a care receiving robot. And uh, I thought it was, was really interesting trying that. I was just, uh, one thing that was not clear to me is whether the two bots were as funny as, uh, similarly funny. Mm -hmm. It seemed to me that the, the care receiving were more, had more uh, humor than the other one. And I wonder if, if it makes a difference talking to 
a bot that's funny versus one that's not, and that how that could impact what the, the results you are. Sure. Uh, good question. So humor definitely is important, and uh, it's not necessarily that one was funnier than the other. Um, what is more implied is uh, how self-aware Vincent was. So humor can be of different types, and Vincent didn't really rely too much on puns, but really did more with self-deprecating humor. So the way he said goodbye, for example, I have chatbot things to do, defragment the server stack, um, that was the case for both. So we try to balance everything out evenly. We also had a, a guideline on how many GIFs or emojis that Vincent could use uh, per conversation. So while we cannot control uh, perceived humor, uh, we try to control for uh, humor uh, in Vincent uh, as much as possible. Uh, but I agree that that might be something we should more carefully look into. Hello, Emily Baldi with Cigna Health Insurance Company. Um, you had mentioned that it's important to consider mental health wellness more in a preventative man a manner rather than a prescriptive repair manner. Um, though I'm wondering, what do you think would be the motivation of individuals to start using this kind of tool in a preventative way if they're not already experiencing some kind of mental unwellness? Great. Uh I'd like to clarify that um, caring mental well-being is definitely a, a good, good pursuit. Um, so I think the focus just hasn't been on trying to help people who might be well uh, stay that way. And it's a common thing to just have a bad day once in a while. Um, and rather than forcing people to have to use these chatbots, it might be nice to think about what options for conversation partners do we have so when people we know might be asleep or uh, they just might not be available to share some common suffering, uh, an option that is now open is a chatbot that's really easy to implement and to have on existing communication channels like Facebook Messenger that we used. So it's not that we would like to force people to use these, but we'd like people to realize that they have an increase in options for conversation partners. Uh, Cosmo Town University of Toronto. Um, I'm just curious if you can speak very briefly on the ethical considerations around this, but also short term in terms of your study. Did you have a therapist on site? Did you have input from a therapist? And on the long term implication of, uh, like, for example, Wobot was heavily criticized by therapists um, for providing inadequate care. Um, what do you think are the implications long term? So maybe quickly if you can cover that, or we can talk later about this. That's a great question that I just didn't have a time to address properly in the presentation. Um, my take is that obviously um, this is a huge uh, ethical gray zone in that I asked in the paper to maybe discuss as a broader community what responsibilities do designers have and should they have those ethical responsibilities. When you're designing for um, emotional complexity, you have to be mindful of how the chatbot expresses its own emotions, but there's no way that designers can control for what emotions are experienced because of the chatbot in the users. So uh, because we are not sure uh, what kind of emotional reactions we need to look out for, all we can first say is, in some cases, it could lead to attachment, and um, we don't want the designers to feel as if they're the only ones responsible. We do think it's a give and take between people who design the bots and people who use the bots, um, and also researchers like ourselves. So uh, indeed, uh, if you do have more time, this is something that we can talk about a bit further, uh, and I don't really have a clear answer on that right now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mina.